Welcome to Core Concepts. As you know, on this show, we talk about the what, who, where, when, and how of spirituality. Most of our guests have been spiritual leaders or religious leaders. And today we've been visiting the Masjid Amun Minun uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, this is not a small facility, it's quite large, and we have had a tour of the museum and a tour of their major community outreach program which is their pantry and I have known uh, Imam Rashid uh, Rashad Sharif for some time due to interfaith conferences and so forth and uh, this is our first opportunity to to talk and to uh, visit Masjid Al Moon Menu. Am I pronouncing that correctly, sir? Good enough. Good enough. Um, this format is pretty simple that we followed on all of these. It's basically asking you, religious leaders, uh, how you came to be where you are in this ministry, um, how you came to even know about it, and mostly I'm going to let you talk. I okay. just want to ask a few questions here and there, and this is the opportunity really to tell people mm -hmm. uh, about this particular mosque and this particular ministry. All right. Okay. Um, I know from earlier conversations that um, you or originally started out as a Christian. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this transformation that you went through? Sure. Um, my family was one of the pillars, so to speak of the local black Episcopal Church. It's called Emmanuel Episcopal Church. The church is still ongoing to this day. So my grandfather and father were trustees in the church, et cetera, et cetera. And I was an altar boy. And uh, in time, I became, I guess, more and more like the lead altar boy. Uh, I was born in 1947. And when I was... 10, which would be 1957, my parents bought uh, a set of coffee table type books called The Great Religions of the World. Now, as an altar boy and a person who went to Sunday school, I had some questions about some things. I had some thoughts and I had some feelings. But when I read this a coffee table book. First I read the children's version that they bought, and then I read the adult version. And when I got to the chapter on Islam, I just lit up. I was a 10-year-old kid, but I kept saying, oh, that's right, that's right, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. So the, they, they struck me and made an impression upon me. There wasn't anything to actually do about it as a 10-year-old kid. You follow whatever your parents have you in. But I was impressed from that moment. And then fast forward several years later to 1975, which would put me at about 28 years old or so. Uh, I was walking down the street and I was handed a flyer about the grand opening of this place. And I had already seen in Jet Magazine that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had passed and that the, his son was coming in and was making changes to have the Islam taught like it's recognized all around the world, which made me think it might be uh, compatible with what I had seen in that book. Was originally it was not compatible? Uh, it was something that most of the Muslim world would not fully recognize. It had some things in, in common, but there was a lot of emphasis on restoring the black man's sense of purpose, dignity, self-concept, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that heavy emphasis on that and all of that work was particular and peculiar to the nation of Islam. So it was really a mission to black Americans as oh, opposed sure. to uh, people in general. Black Americans were the only ones allowed to come in and be members uh, for the longest time. Mm. So that I mean that was the mission. 
and you know, uh, one of the books of the uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad was entitled "Message to the Black Man." Mm. It wasn't called "Message to Everybody." Message to the Black Man, because that was the primary work. Is it still the case, or is there a mixture now? There is a mixture now. There is a mixture now. And I'm not speaking for the current Nation of Islam organization under Minister Farrakhan. I don't actually keep up well enough to authoritatively speak as to what are the practices right now. This community evolved from that when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad passed from this life in 1975 and his son came in and began to continue the restorative work for the African American, but... He was a real educator, wasn't he? But serving as an educator and using the universally recognized uh, principles of uh, al-Islam and the book, the Quran, to get the job done. Is there any connection today between Nation of Islam, uh, Minister Farrakhan, and this organization? Nationally, no. But locally, I would say we're kind of like the best of friends. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so it, for instance, as he passes on, there may be more intergoing in, uh, interaction between, or, or they likely be a new leader there that will keep it separate. Uh, speculation has proven not to be worth speculating, speculating. <laughs> yeah. because there was speculation on what would happen when. Uh, Imam W. Dean Muhammad passed, and it took place in 2008. He passed, and most of people's talk about what would happen, it was just, I don't guess what. And so it continued with each mosque uh, autonomous. That, yes, yes. In the community that was taught by Imam W. Dean Muhammad, uh, local autonomy is the primary organizational structure. And at some point, you must have you, you must have said I've got to go with this this is I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere unless I go with this right um, we talked about my personal journey you personally when I when I first visited here in the grand opening in 1975 um, I got to go back I got to go back it's okay and give a little bit of background around about the time I was given the flyer, to come here, I thought back about those books that I'd read. When you were 10. Yes, and I remember where I had last put them. Mm -hmm. And I went back to my grandma's house, to the closet where I had last put them, and they were still there. Mm -hmm. And I read it, and the, all the feelings came back. So when I came here to visit, my only concern was, could I get to that here? Because the community here was going through its own transition. And so in the back of my mind was just real simply, is this a place? So the image of Islam that you had been created when you were 10 mm -hmm. is still being held up. Mm -hmm. and, oh, and, sure. and so you were really looking at this place as a, whether they were the same thing or not. Well, I already knew that most people here were going through a transition from the nation of Islam that I had never been in. Mm. So my question was, while that's going on, can my journey also take place at the same time in the same building, in the same community? And I decided that it could. And so we all, uh, we all learned together. Well, as I understand it, the only woman mentioned in the Quran is Mary, mother of Jesus, 36 times. And as I understand it, there's there's uh, mention of Jesus and so forth as well. So there must have been uh, some, uh, say, doctrinal or principle that you you felt that this was for you, that this was right. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Now, the Quran mentions uh, several women, mm. women in general, but, you know, mother the Mary of Jesus, Pharaoh's wife, mm -hmm. other, other women, etc., mm. etc. But the 
Jesus is teaching about thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy strength, and all thy mind. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect statement of Islamic doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic beliefs of Islam, I learned them all in Sunday school. It's the, the belief in one God, angels, bringing books of scripture to messengers of God, uh, life after death, and that God has the determining power over all things. Learn that all of that in church. So uh, the beliefs were a reaffirmation of the fundamentals that I learned, and uh, I found it more consistent with the teachings of Jesus than what I had found Thank previously. Thank you, Pastor Church. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Islam does not allow images. I remember reading in the Ten Commandments that there weren't supposed to be images. No great many images. Yes. But I was looking up at the wall of the church, and there's this huge image. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I have an Episcopal friend right now who's trying to disabuse me of this impression that I got when I was little. But when I was confirmed in the church, the... Uh, Bishop came down, and his mitre, or whatever they call it, it looked like a clan hat to me. <laughs> I was in uh, the island of Cyprus for a couple of years, which is uh, figures prominently in your missionary journeys of Paul and so forth mm -hmm. with Salamis and Paphos, and I lived in Paphos, actually. And uh, I would go up to Platris, because at certain times of the year, you could snow ski on Mount Trotus, or you could water ski down on on the coast at the same in the same year, and uh, but there were two very famous 15th century, I think, uh, uh, retreats. It's a um, monastery, mm -hmm. and uh, you walk in. It's like walking into a cave, and the icons are everywhere, mm -hmm. just solid. Mm -hmm. The walls are, are are covered with uh, icons. It's a, it's kind of interesting as to how some of those things would develop, mm -hmm. yeah. especially with uh, with the teaching to have no no images. That's that's uh, was an interesting experience for me. So in in the doctrine, mm -hmm. basic teaching, there's some significant differences between Christianity, especially in the Trinity, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know God is one, mm -hmm. the absolute unity. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what you see there? You ask. I'm asking. Okay. I look at Christianity from a Muslim point of view. I see three concepts just in the word Christianity. I see a trinity right there. I see Christ, and it doesn't stop there. Then I see the addition of Ian. And then I see the addition of it. And I attribute Christ to what Christ taught. Ian brings Paul to mind. And it brings the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, in that whole century of Bishop's Council and what they added. So Islam matches Christ. Ianity is not part of Islam. So Islam is what is back to what Christ taught before it got taken further. Hmm. Well certainly Matthew thirteen thirty five, Jesus said, I came to reveal the secrets that have lain hidden from the foundations of the earth. Mm -hmm. And then it says in the same verse that he spoke to them in parables and only in parables. Mm -hmm. So he saw his mission, primary mission as to bring the, to reveal the secrets, mm -hmm. and even when he was in front of Pontius Pilate, the only thing he would confirm is that he came to reveal the truths. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I take it that that uh, Muhammad, in his in his revelations, was taking that same thing mm -hmm. to bring the to uh, bring revelation as opposed to the the commonly accepted idea that Jesus was sort of dead man walking, he just came in down to die for the sins of the world. Right. Um, I couldn't have said it better. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Uh, we might make you an email. Okay. Uh, as I heard a wise person say uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, I've finished. Before he was even arrested. Uh -huh. What you sent me to do. Mm -hmm. So John 18. Yeah. So that means that the people who say he was sent to do something that hadn't occurred yet, they're looking at it from a different perspective from his a, way. A redaction. And there was an awful lot. So, so the Quran basically just says, don't go too far in, in matters. And uh, the Quran endorses the teachings of Christ as having guidance and light. Now, we know that within Christianity, the first 50 years, most of them were called Edomites. They were led by James, the brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really a recognition of deity here. It was all about his teachings. Mm -hmm. It's with Paul that we begin to get uh, the other. Do is there anything like that that has occurred within Islam, or has the Quran remained without any tint of uh, redaction? Well, I don't think that's the comparison. I think Christ's teachings have remained, and the Quran has remained. Mm -hmm. What teachers teach? There were teachers who were not satisfied with staying within what Christ taught and stopping where he stopped. And their own agenda. They wanted to go further. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the Quran says what the Quran says doesn't have to be tampered with. All a person has to do is start adding some more teachings. And where there are human beings, there is a tendency to put their own thing mm -hmm. into their concept of what needs to be taught. So there are, there are Muslims for sure who teach religion and they don't stop where the Quran stops. Mm -hmm. They don't stop with what Prophet Muhammad modeled and exemplified. They have their own therefore and they're on a mission to spread their therefore idea. Mm -hmm. Within every religion, almost, there seems to be a division, a polarity between the literalist mm -hmm. and the spiritualist. Mm -hmm. For instance, like in in Islam, you'd have maybe Al Rumi, mm -hmm. and on the other side, you'd have uh, Wahhab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have a, you have this uh, polarization that I'm saying. And it's in it's in Buddhism, it's in Christianity, it's in mm -hmm. in, in all. Where do you see the nation of Islam or the, this particular mosque? Well, see, this particular mosque as having an emphasis on being balanced, but, but, we have a difference in thinking from most of the Muslim world, okay? The Muslim world we all have the same fundamental beliefs, but I cannot expect people to, in Egypt, who are, are 15th generation Muslim, to reason with a remembrance of what's in, taught in the church. Yeah. It's just not going to be there. It's just not going to be in the logic. So. Uh, our logic and our sense of balance uh, includes starting points, observations, and insights that a lot of people just would not have. Some people know that there's a major division between the Shia and the Sunni. Mm -hmm. And most recognize this as being a, a matter of Politics, really. One mm -hmm. wanted to, a descendant of Muhammad to be uh, in charge, and the other wanted to have it elected, right? That's true. And, that, and that's the difference in the she and the Sunni. But is there really any difference in what they teach? That's an argument about who should have been um, the leader, not necessarily a, a doctrinal argument. Well, there is a difference in the teachings in that 
each stream, or, uh, each community following Sunni tradition or Shia tradition begins to have its own set of favored scholars. Favored scholars. So the Shia have some scholars that they refer to that maybe the Sunnis don't think of that often. And I don't think it's so much just because of the inheritance issue. Uh, at some point, uh, geographical dominance and uh, positioning of people in the land gets involved, and that has a strong effect. Because when we look at Ireland, right, mm -hmm. the whole thing between the Protestants and the Catholics, was that really just about theology, or was it about how position in the land got apportioned and who felt that they had been treated unjustly and, and that type of a thing. About the Scots coming in there and the, and the, Brit and the English bringing them in. So in fact, in history, something went down where somebody felt that was not fair. And usually economics is involved in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Where there's land, there's economics. So you had a period of time where the Ottoman Empire was pretty much the main Turkey. Mm -hmm. was pretty much the uh, controlling center for, for, for Islam. Uh, did that was that good or was that bad for Islam? I cannot tell you that I've studied it enough to have a well-based opinion. Mm. Okay, M my my life has been kind of consumed with this phenomenon mm. of uh, this conversion and the, the the whole sweet reality that I've come into, and studying the uh, history around the world through the centuries is something I just haven't put on my plate yet. Okay. Well, sorry. I just That's thought okay. maybe you might have a, a uh, some idea or some thought there you want to express. Mm -hmm. Where do you see everything going now? I mean, you've got a, uh, this mosque is um, it's like a church without Jesus or without, without the cross and the, and the statue outside. I mean, you do community work, you have the pantry, which, uh, we viewed the the uh, museum and so forth, but what do you see happening now? Well, the ministry of Imam W.D. Muhammad was actually also called the Mosque Cares. So responding to the neighbors is not something that the church has a monopoly on. It's really not Judeo-Christian to yeah. the exclusion Right. Of others, so uh, there are there are those similarities, um, but um, where I think is where I think things are really going is that the public will get to see what's the reality of what Muslims are all about because right now the concept is mostly dominated by. Uh, dramatic reports, which are like out of touch with the fundamental reality. Um, we are wishing the best for uh, our non-Muslim neighbors, and uh, the community in general may be clueless as to how deep that actually goes. Well, Minister Farrakhan gets a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, in, in, in other communities, it's usually negative, mm -hmm. uh, the response to it. But do you think that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his main purpose of uh, restoring dignity and, and who, who the black man is and so forth, was successful? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I see Minister Farrakhan as an effective continuer of that. And I think... Uh, the dignity that he represents is resented. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, if he was, if he appeared more controllable, if he uh, uh, appeared more like Elijah Muhammad, no, more like the ministers. Mm. Uh, and I think, in my personal opinion, that the. Uh, assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King 
was a tremendous uh, intimidation to Christian ministers. Mm -hmm. See what happens to your number one. Mm -hmm. Who's going to be the next one to raise his head and buck the system? So, um, I think that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's um, work was so effective. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it in terms of this anecdote. Mm -hmm. uh, his seventh son, Imam Wallace Muhammad, Martha Dean Muhammad, met with James Brown, the late James Brown mm -hmm. entertainer. And he commended James Brown on the positive effect that he had had with uh, his inspirational songs. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Mm -hmm. uh, those types of things. And uh, not just one song, but yeah. several of them. And James Brown replied, I got that from your daddy. <laughs> so uh, in that sense, you could say that he, if James Brown had an impact on the culture, it was like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad striking James Brown and James Brown striking America, like in pool. Mm -hmm. You hit the cue ball and the cue ball hits the other ball and then... Mm -hmm. And Muhammad Ali had a big effect too, tremendous effect. So how can somebody be the teacher of Muhammad Ali, Minister Farq, Malcolm X, Imam W. Dean Muhammad, who's received so many awards, mm -hmm. and one man, the mentor of all of these, case closed. Mm -hmm. It is remarkable. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn this last few minutes over to you and uh, just let you deliver whatever message you'd like to deliver. To our to our viewers of core concepts, okay. Should I face the camera? Face you, you can. I have a deep and abiding concern uh, that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's announced vision that we as a people shall make it to the promised land has not been announced as being fulfilled now that 50 years have passed. In scripture, wandering in the wilderness is known as only taking 40 years, and it's been 50 years. Um, we as a people, having been enslaved, have to make the journey to mastery, because that's where the promised land is. If you are no longer a slave and you are not yet in the promised land, then you must be in the wilderness, which is the in-between, which is recovering from slavery but not yet ready to step up into mastery. So I think we African Americans, uh, we don't think as capitalists. We used to be capital. People used to leave us to their descendants in their will. But life enjoying being free was never our destiny. That was not the, the end point. In the Bible, page one, the birds and the fish were created to be free. But the human being was created to have dominion, which means to exercise mastery. And it's in the Quran, too. Right. So we're to Ayah 30, Khalifa. So we have to think like top managers in order to be fully what we were created to be. And if nobody else will teach that, the Muslims have been teaching that since the 1930s. The Nation of Islam's real title in the 1930s was the lost found nation of Islam in the wilderness of North America. So the concept and the recognition that this is a wilderness in between stage for the, for the Muslim African Americans, it goes back to 1930. So we're comfortable talking a different talk. 
taking a different stand, walking a different walk, and we want that for our neighbors so that that vision that Dr. King was speaking from can be fulfilled. But walking around and petitioning others to make changes so our life will be better, that's a non-mastery move. We appreciate you allowing us to visit, okay. come inside, mm -hmm. see the pantry, see the uh, museum, and to take a little time to talk about these things. Appreciate and it. Hopefully you can come back and be with us again Anytime. on some occasion. I want to remind you that if you go to youtube.com, type in Renford Broadcast Network, R-E-N-F-O-R-D, you will be able to find the shows, the core concept shows, you can go to www.iam-cor.org and visit the virtual campus of the Institute of Applied Metaphysics and come back and be with us on another occasion on Core Concepts.